Coming up on DTNS, Google replaces third-party cookies with group targeting, cameras that spy on your neighborhood, and Brave wants to build a new search engine from scratch. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just solving time travel on Good Day Internet. If you would like to get that wider conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Twitter announced it's opening its Twitter Spaces audio chat rooms to Android users, previously available as a private beta on iOS only. Android users will now be able to join Spaces conversations, although they can't start them for now. That functionality is arriving soon. In an SEC filing, Lyft said the last week of February saw its best week of ride volume since the start of lockdowns related to the COVID-19 pandemic. The company narrowed its expected Q1 loss to $135 million and expects to show positive year-over-year -year growth in ride volume for the second half of March. Epic Games acquired Tonic Games Group, which includes the publisher of Regular Corporation, as well as studios Fort Fortitude Games and Media Tonic, makers of Fall Guys. Media Tonic says there are no plans to make Fall Guys free to play, but hopes to bring features of Fortnite and Rocket League to the game, including account systems, crossplay, and squad versus squad modes. Netflix launched something called Fast Laughs on Wednesday for its mobile apps featuring comedy clips from its stand-up specials, TV series, and movies. Netflix says the new auto-playing feed of vertical videos will provide up to 100 curated clips per day. And what? No, we've never heard of TikTok. <laughs> Google officially removed its cardboard VR goggles from its online store, a product originally launched back in 2014. The move is another step in Google's shift away from phone-based VR, having already released a cardboard open-source project for developers and discontinuing its Daydream VR headsets in 2019. My cardboard right here. Well, look at that. Oh, my gosh. Look at it. End of did an you ever, Did never, you ever do it? St still sealed. Yeah, mm. never opened up. Well, now yeah. it's a collector's item, now Tom. Now it's too late. Worth something. Speaking of Google, uh, as we mentioned at the top of the show, Google's going to eliminate third-party cookies. Uh, this is part of the privacy sandbox coming to the Chrome browser. Third-party cookies had already been blocked in Safari and Firefox for a while, uh, so becoming less useful. Google, however, is an advertising company, so it's got to do something to make that advertising money. Here's what it's going to do. In a blog post, the company clarified, quote, it will not build alternate identifiers to track individuals as they browse across the web. They said, you know, some companies are going to offer email address tracking and stuff. We're not going to do any of that. They're going to replace identifiers with aggregation, anonymization, on-device processing, and other privacy-preserving technologies. One of these alternatives, and probably the biggest one, is called Federated Learning of Cohorts, or Flocks. We're gonna have another product called Flock later in the show. Don't get these confused. This is the cohort-based one. Some in-browser machine learning determines which flock you belong to, and then only shares that identifier with advertisers. So the advertiser knows nothing else about you. They can't track you individually. They just know, oh, you're in the person who likes BTS, the St. Louis Cardinals, and Fudge flock. We, we can now target you. Chrome's Privacy Sandbox calls this a web crowd, and it lets you target large groups of people with similar tastes without having to know who they are. Google will begin testing this with advertisers in Q2 this year. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has criticized cohorts because you don't know which cohort you're in and what it's saying about you or how it's constructed and interpreted, and it can reveal sensitive information about you. And of course, a website that does know who you are because maybe you're logged in now knows what flock you're in, which tells them a lot more about you than it would otherwise. Now, granted, third-party cookies can also tell them a lot more than a flock can, but a flock can tell a lot about you too. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to feel about this. The EFF, I always wait for them to kind of to chime in on stuff like this, changes like this. Um, but on the face of it, it seems like a good direction for me as a user who's interested in his security and would like to use Google products and have greater confidence that I'm not being so specifically individualized and targeted all the time. Um, so on the fr on the face of it, I like what this sounds like, but 
when they pipe in and say, hey, some of this isn't transparent enough, that just tells me maybe Google needs to be more transparent about how it's constructed, how it's interpreted, and how it can reveal sensitive information about you. Like if they go all the way on the transparency, then I'm probably going to be okay using Chrome again. I mean, the whole idea of the the flock of, you know, Tom, you mentioned, you know, <laughs> do you like BTS? Are you are from Illinois? Do you like fudge? <laughs> that kind of thing is like, okay, on the surface, I'm like, well, sure. You know, maybe a little bit less personalization as far as tracking me, but sure, I'm, you know, looking at TMZ.com once a week type of thing. Like, you probably get that I have a mild curiosity about pop culture and celebrities type of thing. But do I have that in common with people that I would not like to be associated with? And I think, you know, that has been an age old question with tracking in general and the idea that, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna just think about more of like the trends that you as a person uh, are associated with rather than you as a person sounds good, but the same problems exist. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the example I gave is probably too specific because that could start to narrow down into one. And the flocks are meant to be thousands of people, right? Uh, just enough that a, 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 an advertiser could say like, all right, these are people likely to buy my product. But it's still information about you. And the whole point that I keep hammering on over and over is we want a system where we decide. I would like to have relevant ads from certain companies that I trust and say, yes, you can target me. I have a good relationship with you. And yes, b and I don't want you to show me a list of all the things I already bought. I want you to show me things you think I will want to buy in the ad. Uh, but to do that, you got to give me control over it so I can decide who gets that and who doesn't, which is me bringing up MIT solid and interrupt and all that again. That's not what this does. This is a halfway thing. If you really want privacy, get Firefox, Brave, Safari, something like that. Uh, if you're like Scott, where you're like, you know, I want some better privacy protection, but I still want to use Google. Well, then this is better than what Chrome was doing before. Yeah, good point. Plus, I now know things about you that I didn't before, like the fudge thing. So thanks for letting us know about fudge that. That's delicious. fantastic. <laughs> Uh, well, smart light bulb company LifeX, or is it Lif Life 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 LifeX? It's just LifeX. All right, is now shipping LifeX Clean, a bulb that can potentially disinfect things clean, uh, near you. So I think you know microscopic pathogens and that sort of thing. Uh, LifeX announced the seventy dollar bulb last August. How it works is a blue, uh, high energy, visible HEV light with a wavelength of around four hundred and five nanometers, which studies have shown to sort of uh, inactivate a range of bacteria. This includes things like Salmonella, E. coli, uh, MRSA, and lab-based studies. However, of three studies conducted between 2010 and 2013 uh, on frequently touched surfaces in a hospital burns unit, researchers found that the bacteria reduction varied between 27 and 90%. That's a big gap. Uh, depending on the factors like how many days the light was used for and how much activity there was in the room when it was used. But I got to say... I like the idea of light being used to kill stuff around us in a post-COVID-19 world. Seems like a cool idea, but we're not there yet. Well, and that, I mean, you 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 hit the nail on the head, the, you know, COVID, people saying, what? I can kill germs or, you know, viruses <laughs> that are life-threatening while still having a smart home? Great. Uh, and this is not really doing that, but... It is a step in the right direction. I have a couple LifeX bulbs. Tom, I know you do as well. Uh, they work very much like Hue light bulbs. They're, yeah, you know, got an app. You can do all sorts of things with them. You can uh, connect them to a smart assistant, uh, depending on what you have going on in your smart home. So LifeX does cool stuff already. The idea that uh, the, the bulb that I have that sits on top of my microwave in the kitchen could potentially help me be safer when I am, I don't know, uh, handling raw meat, you know, kind of thing. That sounds great. It does sound like at this point, what we're talking about is it's less of a, yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis, this is actually going to make your kitchen safer, Sarah, and more of a, here's what we could possibly do in the future. And here's where we have seen, uh, some, uh, you know, germs 
become less so in hospital trials. The, this this is a better idea than than it is a product. I love LifeX. I think they're great. And I think LifeX is doing a good job not trying to claim things that aren't true. They put out their own studies that are validated. But when you look at those studies, this kind of light doesn't kill viruses, right? And LifeX isn't trying to say it is, but it doesn't kill viruses. It kills bacteria, certain kinds of bacteria. When you spend two hours or more within 40 centimeters on a glass surface, this isn't like even a desk lamp isn't <laughs> within 40 centimeters of most of your stuff. And I'm not putting a desk lamp in my kitchen right over my cutting area. So once you start moving it away from 47 meter, 40 centimeters, it takes longer for it, sometimes eight hours or more to be able to have any effect. And it still only kills like 80%. Uh, it's, it's just not going to do much in most situations. So I get it. There might be a use for it. It's just this, this particular light, disinfectant properties aren't great and really only work in very specific situations. In those specific situations, it's great. Most people who use this light are probably going to see much of a disinfectant effect from it. Ha having known a few people that came, went to a hospital, came home with C. diff, a terrible, very antibiotic resistant infection, um, and had to go back to the hospital and deal with it. Uh, and it was horrible the idea of getting to a place where, at least in hospital environments, maybe this could be improved, even if it is just bacteria. Yeah, maybe they can we, find out some other kind of light. Now they have a way of delivering it someday. That'd but be we, amazing. We don't have yeah. that yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's not there. Well, we were talking about browsers and how they're getting better every day earlier. And the Brave browser announced that it acquired the open source Tailcat search engine developed by the Clicks, that CLIQZ team, which will join Brave as part of the deal. Unlike other privacy-focused search engines like DuckDuckGo, for example, Tailcat doesn't use any data from other tech companies. It builds its own index from scratch. Tailcat doesn't collect IP addresses either or use personally identifiable information to improve search results either. Brave plans to launch its new Tailcat-based search engine by the summer, if not earlier, it would be offered as a choice alongside Google, Bing, Quant, Ecosia, and others. Yeah, so I love this idea. Brave Brave doing another thing where they, they take it a step further and say, yes, using the Bing search index is great, and you can do privacy protection around it. But what's better is if we just do it all from scratch ourselves, and that way we're not giving any information to Bing or anybody else. Uh, and that also means we don't know if this is going to work very well or not. Tailcat wasn't even implemented into Clicks; It was just in development by the Clicks team. So, I mean, on the one hand, and they're saying this, they could come up with something new because, you know, Google has a harder time innovating because they're they're so old. At You know, they've been around for so long and, and it's, it's harder to, to move a big ship like Google. So Tailcat is more nimble, but also... Mm is unproven. Like, we don't know uh, what it could do. They could do some, a lot of things around transparency with the algorithm and, and be able to adapt faster and stuff like that. Whether there'll be a good search engine or not, I don't know. Well, this is what I like about uh, DuckDuckGo, which I use a lot. Um, we talked pre-show a little bit about how sometimes uh, even that, which I think is pretty robust, you'll run out of options and you got to move somewhere else or usually back to Google to get uh, you know the kind of results you're looking for. But I think that if there's ever going to be a search engine that really does break through, and you could argue DuckDuckGo is already there. Maybe uh, this Tailcat engine could do the same, but where it'll break in is not from the top or trying to compete with the massiveness of, of Google and its algorithm. It will be from these directions, better security, uh, less information collected, um, and, and keep improving and iterating on those. That is attractive to people as a thing to jump to, whether it becomes dominant or not in the way that Chrome did in the browser market or other examples out there of coming out of nowhere and taking over market share. Maybe not, probably not, but I really like that these alternatives exist and uh, let's see what they do with this one. Hey folks, if you're like, I've got a search engine for you, or I want to know why they can't just uh, use destructive UV light as a, as a household light, uh, join in the conversation in our discord. Do it by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash D T N S. All right. We're going to talk about flock again. But this is Flock, the brand of camera that is used for neighborhood surveillance and can detect people, animals, and bicycles, but is best at detecting cars, specifically recognizing their license plates and their license plate numbers. 
Clock cameras can log the color, make, license plate number, and state of a car based on the license plate state. It can also learn which vehicles are resident and then only record the non-resident vehicles. The cameras work across distances of 8 to 120 feet. Trade publication IPVM did some testing and found that the identification worked well. Misidentification happened mostly with buses, not with cars, uh, or sometimes it wasn't as good at determining the state. Cameras are set up with a solar panel and a cellular connection, so you don't have to wire them into anything. They can store images in the cloud for 30 days, then they get rid of it. A flock camera costs about $1,500 to $2,250 a year, depending on your setup. They're usually sold to homeowners associations, law enforcement, or businesses. Administrators of a flock camera say in your homeowners association can share that data with whomever they want. But flock has set up a program specifically to make it easy to share that data with police. Motherboard obtained hundreds of emails from about 20 police departments in the United States detailing the use of a program from Flock called Talon, T-A-L-O-N, to look up information collected from Flock cameras. Talon scans approximately 500 million vehicles a month. More than 500 police departments in more than 1,000 U.S. cities have access and Flock claims it can help police solve four to five crimes per hour. That sounds like a lot. Flock, like Ring before it, works with police departments to encourage residents to buy the cameras and participate in Talon. Police can search by all the attributes Talon collects, you know, things like car color, license plate number, etc., but also things like spoilers, roof racks, uh, stuff like that. A reverse image search feature planned for later this year will let police see previous movements of the vehicle that may have been captured on all the different Flock cameras participating in Talon. And Flock is partnering with Axon, which makes in-car cameras used for detecting license plates. That will feed into Talon as well. Flock makes two models of camera. The Sparrow model collects data for later review, and the Falcon can send automatic alerts to police if a vehicle on a hot list is detected. Uh, the Sparrow is not sold alone. You have to buy a Falcon to get a Sparrow as part of a set. Uh, only the Falcon is sold individually. So every setup is going to have a Falcon, which can ping the police. Seems like the Falcon oh, should boy. eat the Sparrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're okay. This is the story is dense. Uh, it, on one hand, I think okay, given the world that we live in, at the very you know kind of basic level of saying, okay, Sarah's from California. She has California plates, but she's in Idaho. Uh, that might help us determine, uh, you know, how many people from one region of the U.S are in this other region of the US and and be able to help I don't know medical professionals kind of get a sense of where people are and 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 where we're all migrating right so like in that sense I'm like this is pretty cool and it seems to work well of course when you're talking about police departments and why you might want to target certain people and why uh, certain people might be flagged a very different story well, yeah, and, like, and that, that's yeah. the good use, right? The good use is uh, the police know that uh, uh, somebody sneaked in and robbed this house in your neighborhood. Let's go to the tape and find out which non-resident cars came in and out of the neighborhood at that point, and that'll let us possibly solve the crime. Right. I mean, my right. my my yeah. my worry or my take on this is that the same scrutiny that now, uh, you know, they got piled on top of Ring will just get piled on top of these guys. And they even have a cool, super sinister standing uh, <laughs> project name like Talon. Yeah. Ooh, in well, fact, the, I think Talon the, literally is. Falcon like, is the camera. Talon <laughs> is the claw. Yeah. Right. No, it the makes claws. sense to me. But it also sounds like Batman needs to take down Talon before all of Gotham suffers, right? Like it just has <laughs> this, has this kind of weird uh, sound to it. But Personally, I always look at these things, and my initial feeling is, oh, it's great. We're going to help with crime. Crime's no good. Nobody wants crime. We're going to have less right. crime. Good job thing that gets rid of crime. And then I remember not every uh, police department slash cop slash system slash whatever is the same, and uh, it's it, and so now it's problematic. And I don't know how you get around that because on it, the one hand, this feels like an important service, and on the other hand, it feels dangerous. If you had a person sitting in a lawn chair at the end of a cul-de-sac – uh, writing down the make and model and license plate number of every car that came in and knew, like, oh, I don't have to write Scott. He lives here. Uh, how would you feel about that? 
if that was only usable yeah. when the police said, hey, uh, we noticed there was a robbery. Do you have who who drove in at that point that wasn't a regular? Here you go. I don't think most of us would be too uncomfortable with that. I think right. what makes us uncomfortable is the idea that this is happening automatically, that that we could just be driving through a neighborhood and get logged. And is that OK? Uh, and and that there isn't a legal recourse for the collection. You don't have to have a warrant to be able to get the images out of here. So I don't really have a problem with, you know, some of these neighborhoods in LA, there's a neighborhood in Sherman Oaks uh, that, that, that is using this, uh, are so busy that actually tracking all the cars that go through there is useless because there's too many cars, unless you know which car you're looking for. If you're like, aha, we know that this person conducted a crime and we wanna know if they w went through this neighborhood at the time, because that'll help us to determine where they were and that'll help with the case. Well, then that's useful. But a lot of neighborhoods don't have that much traffic. And so going through becomes, you know, something that invades your privacy more. It's just about, again, it's like all this stuff. It's about the controls around the data. Yeah, you made all kinds of good points there. The only thing I would say that is almost 100% true all the time is if you got that neighbor in the chair that's marking down every car that comes in, everyone thinks that neighbor's weird, even if that <laughs> stuff helps with crimes. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a yeah. feeling of, Ugh, why does he do that? Urgh. And that, I don't know how you avoid it, even on a big tech level like this. I just, I think everyone's well, going to And we didn't even weird. get into the, the idea that, you know, neighborhoods that can't afford to even group together and buy a $2,000 camera don't have the advantage in, in using it properly to catch criminals. And then right. there's more crime in those neighborhoods than there are in these richer neighborhoods that are able to buy this. Yep. Well, AMD made some announcements today. Let's start with Resizable Bar, a feature of PCI Express graphics that lets a CPU directly access a GPU's memory for better frame rates. AMD calls it a smart memory access. AMD also launched its 5000 and 6000 series processors and announced Wednesday it will bring Resizable Bar to the 3000 series as well. You'll need a motherboard with a B55 uh, 550 or X570 chipset to its most mostly for people building new systems. Intel adopted resizable bar back in January when paired with NVIDIA RTX 3000 series GPUs. And NVIDIA also supports resizable bar and AMD chips. AMD also announced the RX 6700TX that's launching on March 18th for $479, which is $100 less than the RX 6800. The 6700 XT has 230 watts of power, 12 gigabytes of video memory, and 40 compute units compared to 60 for the RX 6800 and 80 for the RX 6800 XT. It requires an eight pin and six pin connector. Amazing price on this thing. Um, like that's really competitive, as you might expect in this very dog eat dog world of video card manufacturing right now. But uh, I feel like we're in the same boat with like, when can you get one? Oh, it's impossible to get. Oh, while well, the bots yeah. got them, they got all sniped. Like I, I'm real concerned about that again, especially because that price is so low. That's really good for that power. And uh, I don't know when this nightmare ends with like cards just not being available. Yeah, I mean, that's just something where the chip shortage has to work itself out. Capacity has to increase. You know, the market has to, to settle out. We've talked about that before on the show. I don't think this, the uh, 6700 XT is going to be any more available than any other. Uh, it is more entry level, though, so maybe it'll be less appealing to some of the resellers because of that. But the resizable bar is a big deal because that's bringing something to existing chips, which you might have an easier time getting because they're lower level, but now they'll have better performance because you can do resizable bar on them. So bringing resizable bar to the 3000 series AMDs uh, could be helpful, especially if you're building a, a, a new machine because they may be a little easier to get a hold of as well. Yeah. Well, everybody who has pets, listen up, because pet training company Companion is ready in a smart device to help with training, particularly for dogs, but not just dogs. The Companion trainer uses sensors to observe your pet, see what they're doing, then shares those signals to its own AI so that the machine can then respond with light or sound or a tree to reinforce good habits. Human trainers can also be added as companion coaches through video consultation. So it's not just AI. There's some other stuff going on here. Companion is taking pre-orders now. We have no word on pricing, but initial deliveries are set for mid-2021. Yeah, the CDET story no noted that this was designed by Frog Design, 
uh, Frog Design, a, a kind of legendary Silicon Valley design company that that designed Macs uh, and stuff, and it really does look in, like an in, iMac. In fact, the the yeah the the iMacs of the late. Uh, I was going to say 1900s. That's not right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the latest like, 1900s, because we became yeah, the sure. 20s. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, sure. yeah, that works. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, li I live, I have a large dog. Uh, I want to say that my dog is, you know, always follows the rules, but that's not 100% true. Um, and I also have limited space because I live in a small apartment. This is not a small device. There is no real corner that you could put this in without saying, oh, okay, I have to move something. I mean, it's 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 somewhat large. That said, the idea that uh, especially, and especially with people who perhaps not just adopted a pet because of the pandemic, but have been around a little bit more often than what might be real life, you know, in it in, in the before times type thing, and being being forced to deal with behavioral issues that might result from a pet saying, well, "Wait a second, uh, you're not around as much to you know give me all of the positive reinforcement that I need to be the best version of myself." To have something like this that's going, that's going to help the household in general is great. Uh, I I. I know that it's not going to work for everybody exactly the same way because no pet is the same, but but I love the idea. Yeah, I like it a lot. I always, I always see, uh, especially on TikTok, people put up videos of these dogs that have an array of buttons out in front of them. I'm sure you've seen these. And one of them will say, I'm hungry. The other one says, oh, uh, yeah. whatever. And if they push yeah. it, they get a tone out of it. And they've been trained to know, well, if I push this button over here in the upper right, that's the one that gets me a treat or that's the one that goes on a walk or I have to go to the bathroom or whatever. So it's clear that dogs can do more than we give them credit for sometimes in terms of these learning patterns. So why not a box that helps you do it? I think it's fine. I just yeah. think it's ugly. It doesn't replace your big. time with the pet. It replaces right. time that you would have a trainer working with them because you can do the video training through here right. or time when you're not there, uh, like, right. like Sarah was saying. I think it's good. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we got one from Jesse. This is back to our conversation from last week about – uh, face recog uh, recognition glasses and what that might be used for. And is it a great idea? Jesse says, are we going under the assumption that the glasses would recognize anybody or just anyone else with the glasses? Jesse's assumption was that it was meant for two parties, both wearing the glasses. Jesse says, I assume when AR glasses eventually come to market that they would have the capability to ping one another to ask for and then grant information. Glasses would be registered to an account and then you could set your privacy settings about who could see your information and who couldn't. Friends only, friends of friends, or anybody. I personally would like a friends of friends option. I could identify people in future social gatherings as well as having an icebreaker to expand my own social circle without having my friend actively present. I mean, I like the idea of, uh, of glasses that talk to each other. Like in the science fiction movie version of our AR life, I want to be able to walk by a friend and have it exchange some cool data and go, be -de -be -de -be -be. Oh, cool. You've seen that. I was, that's great. I'll have, you know, and not have to really talk to them, just sort of go by and get the updates. But this idea of like, I need to both facially recognize you and exchange data seems redundant to me because I, if I know them, I know them. If I don't know them, I, I well, guess it'll we tell were, me. We but yeah. Go ahead. We were talking in our pre-show about, well, I mean, if it's facial recognition, then it's facial recognition. It, this is not, you know, this kind of like handshake agreement that Jesse's talking about isn't totally what facial recognition is all about. But I get where you're coming from, Jesse, is like, if I am opted into this experience and someone else is as well, then that is great information to share between the two of us. But, you know, what happens when people differ on you know the their comfort level yeah i i overall though i guess i guess my my big take on this is i want these things to be extremely capable but we talk about cameras and problems with people sharing information and have too much personal data going out we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the mess that that stuff represents so we're nowhere near this uh that utopian idea of all this information being shared in this way but We'll get there. It'll be okay. We'll find a happy medium. Just let me control it. Let me <laughs> yeah. have control over my data and everything will be fine. 
Oh, I love your positive attitude. Scott. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you have ideas about what we should talk about on the show, what we have talked about on the show, questions, comments, or anything in between, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. Also, we'd like to shout out patrons at our master and our grandmaster levels. Today, they include Michelle Sergio, Johnny Hernandez, and David Mosher. Also, thanks to brand new bosses, Carl Dawson and Killing Me Softly, just started mm. backing us on Patreon. Thank you so much to the new bosses. Y'all the best. Also the best is Scott Johnson. Scott, always good to have you. Every Wednesday, hump days were never so sweet. What else has oh, been going on with you? It was very nice for you to say. Uh, lots of things. If you want to keep track of my goings on, the easiest way to do it is over at frogpants.com. You'll find podcasts. You'll find artwork. You'll find comics. You'll find all sorts of uh, stuff that I like to put out in the world, and hopefully you like some of it. So check it out. That's frogpants.com. And if you want to interact with me directly, you can always find me on Twitter, at Scott Johnson. Hey, folks, we're going to get together with This Week in Science on April 17th. Now, I know that that's a ways off, but it's getting closer all the time. And we want to know, what would you love to hear the host of the preeminent science podcast, This Week in Science, Kiki and uh, Justin and uh, Blair, uh, talk to us about we're going to talk about technology and science and how it crosses over so we want your ideas email them to us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com or you can also email them to twist just be sure to put twist in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion uh send us those ideas you what do you want to hear uh kiki and blair and justin and sarah and tom and roger talk about on april 17th in the big twist crossover that's feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Meet you here. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Private Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>